right, everybody, welcome back to the More Doors podcast. Today is episode 25, and we're super excited. We are going to do a GP deep dive on Deep Blue Capital Zone, Nick Good. Oh, so yeah. it's we're going to go through uh, a whole lot of information today right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back again to the More Doors podcast. We are coming up to the holiday season here, guys. Christmas is in the air. Yes, it is. Happy Hanukkah to those that are celebrating. Merry Christmas to those who are preparing and doing all the shopping and trimming the trees right now. I'm joined by my two very handsome co-hosts, Brian Force and Nick Good. And today we're going to... uh, we're going to do a little GP profile. You know, we've talked a lot on prior episodes about the importance of betting on the jockey, not the horse, and really understanding your sponsors. So we thought we would talk amongst each other, kind of interview each other, and and help all of you understand who we are as people and investors and get to know us a little bit more. But before we do that, we are going to say a big thank you to our sponsors. First sponsor of the day, Big Jesse. Tour Studios, T-O-R-E Studios.com. Jesse uh, produces this show, has for all 25 episodes, and has a great business. He's growing. So uh, thanks, Jesse. And go to TourStudios.com if you're trying to get a podcast off the ground. And uh, second, maybe not in order, Mm -hmm. Deep Blue Capital. Go to DeepBlueRE.com. Those guys are uh, those guys are awesome. If I can say so myself, that's what I've heard. They they throw great parties. Yes. Had a great Christmas party for our investors and our network last week at the uh, Mexican Bar Company here in Plano, Texas. Great food. Had some leftovers. It was excellent. Uh, Have the margaritas. I'm kind of game if if Mexican Bar Company becomes our staple place. I think they think so. Their service was phenomenal. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The food was, I mean, top notch. I mean, I agree. For for, for, yeah, people are still talking about the food. Yeah, like that I've run into and the drinks. We're excellent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Even and Nick, Nick was very happy because they got three cherries in the old fashions. Yeah. I three. won't drink them if there's one or two. Okay. Or zero. Excellent. It has to be three. <laughs> so he he listens to the one star reviews and gets three cherries in the old fashions. So take notes, people, because right. this is Nick good for you. You want to know what to get me for Christmas. <laughs> <Nice. Okay>. uh, <laughs> go to deepbluecapital.com. Subscribe to our deep blue I'm sorry, deepbluere.com. You I think I'd know that by now, yeah. right? Go to deepbluere.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. Check us out. Uh, we have 24 other episodes of the podcast and two webinars now that are hosted yeah. on the website, right? And uh, we're constantly putting out some great content. And we'll have some news here about what we're doing in 2024 real soon. So without any further ado, Brian, how you doing? I'm good, buddy. How are you? Um, Brian is giving the Colorado feel vibes today with the you know, long sleeves and the vest. We get like so few opportunities in Texas to wear cool vests and stuff. I feel like I was born... Well, I wasn't born here. I live in the wrong state for my style. Yeah. I like this. I've I've finally ventured out into the vest world. Yeah. I'm kind of digging it. Well, yeah. I do a vest with no shirt. <laughs> you just, really? just the vest. Yeah. Do you wear shorts with <laughs> your vest too? Uh yeah, short shorts. Short shorts. Daisy Dukes. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and with like sandals and black socks too. Of course. It's yeah, I gotta fit in with Colorado people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, Love you, Colorado people, yes. Coloradoans. Look, that's where that's where I'm going to retire. So I definitely nice. I'd you gotta, love it. There. Yes. I like it. Colorado. That's lost. That's, that's my uh, sanctuary. Hell yeah! Nice. All right. So today, GP profile. The GPDP. Oof. I don't know about that. We might have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With GP profile for Nick Good. Uh, Nick is uh, one hell of a guy, and I'm not just saying that because I'm. I'm in the same room and partners with him, yep. but uh, mm-hmm. Nick's got some great character, great reputation in the business on both the residential and multifamily side. And a lot of our listeners don't get to spend as much time with Nick as we do. So we thought it'd be a good idea for Nick to tell a little bit, tell our audience a little bit about himself and what he values and yep. what his history in the real estate mm-hmm. game is and really, you know, why multifamily and what he's really looking to deliver to our investors. So Nick, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. You're, you're yeah. very welcome. I'm very nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous, Nick. It'll be over before first you time, know. Yeah, first time. <laughs> Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> awesome. So, Nick, uh, for the listeners out there, 
you know, why don't you get us started? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so um, have a, uh, I'm a husband, have an amazing wife who uh, runs the show. She is the CEO of the Good Family Industries and um, uh, three great kids have, um, you know, some, all my businesses are in real estate. So got into, got into real estate in 2005 as a residential real estate assistant after uh, learning that I could not be, it wasn't advisable to be a career pizza delivery driver. Right. I mean, I was I was single at the time and I was like, I probably can't get a, a good date. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not a hot prospect at that time if I'm just mm-hmm. delivering pizzas. So um, had a desire to get into real estate investing. And um, there was a job that came up to be a real estate assistant, got that job. And uh, the rest is history. I, 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 you know, went from that to becoming a licensed real estate uh, agent and started selling houses and then started building a residential real estate team in 2009 called the Good Home Team with my brother and business partner in 2010. Um, we got the, the first chance to start building what is now our real estate, you know, investment portfolio. And that was a short sale that came about through our network. And, and, uh, the person reached out to us to help, help sell it. Turned out we knew the bank that was, you know, going through the foreclosing process and it was a credit union. And, uh, so at that time, you know, we were, you know, we could call the credit union up and we started to learn. They gave us, you know, more than enough information and, we just made an offer to that that homeowner. Said, "Let me, let us help you out on that. Um, let us help you out on that." And um, you know, from there, we you know made decent money on that one, and that kind of that ripped the bandit off. We then started going into residential flips, wholesaling, and then buying our first rental property in 2011. Fast forward to today, that has that had transpired into owning well over 500 doors. You know, compared to what we bought and sold. You know, mm-hmm. our rental portfolio. And, um, and, you know, then we got into the build the rent development space. Mm. So the, the asset holdings we have today are townhomes and duplexes that we built, um, in Denton, Texas primarily. And, um, then we've got some storage, like five or six storage holdings as well as an assisted living and then a partner here in deep blue capital. Nice. There's a lot there to unpack. Yes. This is going to be a great show. Oh yeah. So before you started as a real estate assistant, Nick, what were you doing? I was in college. Okay. So what attracted you to real estate from college? Um, you know, we wanted to get in real estate investing. So mm-hmm. my brother and I had had this desire to be in real estate investing. And, um, um, you know, from there it was, you know, what better way to learn the investment game than to, to this, this real estate assistant job popped up and mm-hmm. it was like, this is the best way to learn it. What did, what were you doing exactly? What is a real estate assistant? I was assisting uh, a brokerage. So I was assisting them on their lead generation activities, mm-hmm. you know, client events, you know, mailers, um, handling their database and, and answering any, any incoming calls. Wow. Can you imagine Nick being an assistant? No, <laughs> no, I don't know. I why. wasn't a very good one. Yeah, I don't know why that, <laughs> yeah. that makes me laugh. Why weren't you a good one though? Just because I'm, I'm not the most detailed oriented person on that, right? So I'm, I'm a high D personality on the disc profile. And mm-hmm. so um, I'm more of a driver. Once you kind of tell me, I take charge of, of it. But I'm not, you know, my I don't have like if you look at my desk. I know where everything is, but it's not organized and neat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and you know, it's like a bull in a china shop. I'll get it done. We had, but you know, sometimes there's a mess behind it. We had sure. Dana in the office yesterday, property manager, and she was like, "This place is a mess." And I was like, "This place is so much more organized than Nick's office." You are <laughs> <laughs> lucky that we. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what I've but noticed. You is. know what I've noticed though about the piles of stuff on my desk. It tends to be in chronological order. Yeah. So yeah. when you you know when you need to look for you something, just go down, just the, yep. go down the stack. Hundred percent. You know, my wife does that with like books I'm reading. She'll move them oh. if I leave them out in places, and they get all mixed up. Does she do that on purpose? I don't think she does it on purpose. She just doesn't understand that that's the way I keep things organized, and that like what it's doing to me when she moves things. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Bless her heart. I love her so much. She's great. Yeah. All our ladies are great. We do uh, have great. Yeah, ladies. we do. We do, and they all get along, which is <laughs> yes. even better. I yeah, know, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's because Deep Blue Capital throws the best parties. How can you absolutely? Yeah, absolutely. it's all about the parties. <laughs> all right, so Nick, you start in two thousand five, real estate assistant. Yep. Like, I'm sure there's plenty of people that start in real estate and figure out it's not for them. Right. What What did you see about the industry that helped you 
realize it was definitely for you and that you wanted to continue to grow and invest in the space? Well, I didn't. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> good to, question. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. 2007, I graduated college. Um, I was on the eight year plan. Where'd you go? University of Texas at Dallas. Nice. Yep. Um, you know, fighting the fighting comments or did they fight? I don't even know. The it's, fighting comments? I don't know if they call it the It's the comments. It's the comments. But yeah. I don't know. Does it fight? Crashes. That's pretty cool though. Yeah. The fighting comment. Um, and so uh, graduate college and uh, at the time they uh, it was part time. They offered me a full time salary position with some overrides off of commissions that would, the brokerage would earn. And I went to them and said, hey, you know, do you I, if I went full time as a 100 percent commissioned licensed sales agent, could I make one hundred thousand dollars? And he's like, yeah, I was like, cool, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and and this was 2007. I just bought a house. I just got married and just graduated college all within like a 90 day span wow. while making this decision. And um, I did not make $100,000. I sold three houses. And in 2008, during that time, the 2008 crash happened. And, you know, I was 24 in 2007, I was 24 and then I was 25 in 08. And I was, I was treating the business and my work ethic like a typical young 20 something. It was, it wasn't consistent. I was sleeping in, I was going out late. I was not really doing, not wor working it like I'm a business owner. Um, and you know, when the crash happened, I actually had eight deals under eight, eight contracts in one month, um, that was set to close. And, and it was a lot of money. I was walking around. I was like, man, once this, this closes, I'm rich. You know, I'm like, I'll, I'll be set for the rest of the year. I don't really have to work. And then when the when the financial collapse happened, all eight of those contracts fell out. Wow. And they never came back. And at that time, you know, I did what any normal human being would be. They freak out. Yeah. And start questioning, is this industry for me? Can I even, you know, withstand the ups and down commission roller coaster? And uh, I started looking for jobs. And at that time, you know, the job market was not great. Yeah. You know, everyone was losing their job. Employers weren't really hiring. And if they were, I mean, you were competing against 50 to 100 other people. And so I went on several job interviews, got a job offer from a foreclosed asset management company that wanted to, uh, you know, that offered me like 60 or $65,000 a year salary. They had some bonuses in there, but their work hours was, was Monday through Saturday because mm -hmm. they were backlogged with, with foreclosures. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to hit their bonus level, I really needed to work on Sunday and magically squeeze an eighth day in. To, to clean it up and hit their bonus level. And it would still, even with their bonuses, it wasn't going to be more than probably 85 or 90 grand. Um, and I said, great, you know, let me go home and talk to my wife and, I'll, and let me, let me connect and, and get back with you tomorrow. I needed, I didn't have any money. Yeah. Like I was running out. Um, and on the way home, you know, this light bulb moment hit me. That was, um, if I work the hours that this job requires me to work in my real estate business, whatever I do if as a business owner, I said, I'm, I know I can make more than $65,000 a year because what I was doing was I was, I was expecting to make full-time income on less than part-time effort. Mm. Right. And say that again, like that's important. Yeah. So I was expecting to make full-time income, but I was actually working as a part-timer or, or, or actually less than part-time effort. Right. Part-time is at least probably less than 32 hours I was probably realistically working three to five hours, um, probably a month, <laughs> but expecting to make a hundred thousand. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, reality just set in is like, all right, if I go take this job, they're going to require me to show up to get paid and I'm going to have to do the work. Otherwise I'm getting fired. And so the next morning I called them up and I turned down that job and I went to work. I started working seven days a week in my business. I started, you know, learning the real estate sales business. I started learning everything I could about residential real estate. And then eventually, you know, it just took off. 2009 had a great year. It was the first year, first time I'd broken, you know, got back into that six figure. 2008, I was on pace to make 100,000 and then everything crashed. Yeah. Um, and so um, started to learn how to talk with people that weren't in my network. And then from there, started to build, build a sales team because I, I, you know, quickly realized that, you know, 100% of my efforts is good, but. I would rather have I'd rather have people next to me helping expand those efforts because then we can run further, farther, faster together. Yeah, and started to build the good home team with my brother in two thousand nine, 
2010 happened and we were still having that success and growth. And that's when, when we realized, all right, um, my brother was more suited in the investment space. That's how his brain operated. And so when that, when that short sale opportunity came up, we we're like, this is what we've been looking for. This is what we got. That's why we got in this business. We read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We tried to do creative financing when we were underage. Um, we were trying to do everything, we're trying to get into mobile homes. And we're just trying to find our space, right? And it was never about, you know, becoming a billionaire. It was all about creating financial freedom. Yeah. hundred nice. percent. Man, so much there, yeah. John Power. Oh my! Like I, I, I don't even want to. I don't even want to go back in, 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 in the mirror necessarily. You had the first investment opportunity was a short sale. You got that done. I think that's the biggest part for everyone who's who's never pulled the trigger on their first investment. Is like you mentioned, ripping the band aid off, and it really is what it feels like. You, you just you get that first deal done. You realize the world hasn't fallen apart. All the worst things that you feared did not manifest. Actually, you know, you did a good deal and, and now you've got energy and momentum and you're excited to do more. What did it look like to transition from just running the real estate sales team to go, we're going to have a systematic approach to our investment side. We've got one deal done. So how did we, you, you guys are running in a lot of different directions. How did you come together and go like, this is how we're going to run our investment side? No, we, we, what we learned is you can't have two chiefs. And yeah. the, you know, running the show, and so ultimately we divided and conquered. And and look in any business, whether whether it's re residential real estate sales, whether it's it's residential real estate investing, or building you know the multifamily investment space, there is a form of sales and lead generation that is necessary. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and it's about your network. And so ultimately, what we did is we started to go out and and research what in the other top investors were doing and we we put a lead generation mechanism in place we started sending out mailers to to the right targeted people um, at that time there was a lot of HUD foreclosure so we were going after HUD foreclosures and, and wholesaling them yeah. um, you know we built some software programs you know we had some great people in our world at that time we just built programs that worked for a temporary uh, time because it only worked in that space sure. um, and we knew it wasn't forever, but what was forever was putting certain mechanisms. We knew that, you know, we some we were going to flip, right? We looked at everything at an angle. We we're going to flip some. Could we list some and broker them out, or could we keep them in our rental portfolio? Yep. And as we started inquire, we we bought some at, at auction. I think auction auction.com really got big during that time. Yeah. We bought several through auction.com that uh, side on scene that was originally going to be a flip, and then once we saw them, we're like, oh shit this is worse than we thought. And yeah. so we had to turn them into rental properties. And so 2010 to 12, we acquired about, I think it was like 25, pro, you know, single family rentals. Wow. Um, and you know, what we, what we had learned was that building this is great. We're never going to be rich or really financially free just buying single family rental properties. Yeah. Right. Because, Usually the cash flow is is two to five hundred bucks net a month. Well, you know when you have two people splitting it, or if you just have one, you you got to have a lot of them to make really to replace your yep. your current income. Yep. And then if there's vacancies or repairs, that could wipe out your income altogether. Yep. And so we started looking at other other options. And what we did is in in 2015, one of our networks, we were presented a um, we were presented an opportunity to take down a duplex development, an unfinished one. They had built five duplexes on the ground. It was a, it was thirty six unit or thirty six uh, duplexes, so seventy two units. And the partners were in a, a disagreement, so you know, we put everything on the line and took that down. And my brother built that up, and that became that really became what what our A and G our A and G real estate holdings was. Um, you know, designed to be. We yeah. were a build to rent development uh, investor that we bought other land. We we built a, a 58 unit duplex development a mile and a half up the road. And then uh, we started another project during COVID that was slated to be an 89 unit. Um, we've got 46 on the ground. And then of course, COVID and some other uh, unfortunate events happened that we are 50% complete on that. So we've got 46 of the 89 mm -hmm finished at the moment and then just kind of analyzing our options, whether we're going to complete that project or sell it off. Yeah. yeah. So there's so much, I think Nick did a great job kind of hitting 
the key points there. But like my takeaways were Nick early in his career learned the fundamentals, right? The marketing, the mailers, kind of the 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 lead gen stuff that you talked about. You had a goal, hit rough times decided to not chase the shiny penny and to stick with it. You were vested in it, right? And then you see an opportunity and you're, you had started to build a team, which I want to dig into in, in a second. And then you see the short sale opportunity. And like my brother th- thought better about that side of the business. So we divided and conquered. So you're recognizing your strengths. You're dividing and conquering or delegating, right? You're implementing the things that you learned in 2005 to kind of accelerate the business, and then you're building systems and processes to really accelerate it. And then you have a moment in clarity that's like, okay, we're doing this and it's great, but we're not going to get to where we want to go by doing this. So let's go find the next thing where we have some transferable knowledge, transferable skills, and maybe can can leverage that for higher returns. Correct. What I think you run an amazing team. And again, I'm not just saying that. Like What you've done with EXP and the Good Home team is phenomenal. When did you decide that leadership was for you and building your own sales team was for you? I don't, that's a great question. I don't, ha- I don't know. And I still question whether I'm a good leader. I don't like, I, I never like to say I'm good at something because I don't, I always believe that we can be better. And so, and there's always flaws. And in, in, in my opinion, there's always, as a leader, you know, I always look at this, right? We look at what opportunity looks like, and and as a leader, I look at if I'm making, am I making a decision based solely on me, or am I making it based on putting my people in a better position? Mm. And I think number one, what I do is it's always about my people. If it betters them, then it betters us. And any move or any decision, anything that's made, is not about 100% impacting me in a, in a positive way. Right. Because that is, you know, I was just talking to my son this morning on the way to school about this is their book that there's it's called Leaders Eat Last. Yeah. Yeah. Simon Simon Simon. Yeah. And so. um, So from that, I was I was kind of, you know, he's he's playing basketball right now and, and he's definitely the leader and he doesn't know it. And I said, look, your your job is to you take control of this team and you need to you need to kind of you know show them what to do. Right. We don't boss them around. We show them what to do. And so. You know, I, I just believe that that's from any type of trade I have, any decision I make is not based to only, you know, uh, positively impact my pocketbook. It has to impact my people. Yeah. So I think that's where, where that came from. I don't know how that developed. I think ultimately from, from you know, I was aligned with Keller Williams in the beginning. They had amazing personal development. And one thing that I do is, you know, I wish that I could turn this off, but I can't, is that I don't like to read, you know, um, fluff books, right? Like anything I read has to be personal development. It's got to be something that's going to make me better, whether it's marketing, sales, leadership, better business owner, better with my investments, better marketing. That's the only type of books I can read. I can read nothing yeah, else. Yeah, same. Yeah. Right? Because everything else is boring. I don't need to live in fantasy land. And so... You know, it's it's just over time as I've read and 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 you know the the bits and pieces I pick up that fits my personality traits and the lifestyle that I want to build and and hopefully hopefully the lifestyle that people around me want to build, then that's that's the type of leader and that's how I want to build our organization. So it just happened over time. Got it, got it. Well, I definitely want to transition into into the kind of multifamily side, but before we do that, like give the give our listeners an idea of the scope of the business that you've built with EXP, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of the top sales teams in in the state of Texas, um, top twenty five. Um, there's over ninety thousand agents with with it, um, and I mean it's it's does over two million dollars yearly in revenue, and that's growing. Um, even in this down 2023, it was a down market. One of the worst real estate markets we've seen really actually probably lower transaction, you know, closing side than, than the lowest point of the great recession. Um, and we've had our best year ever. Really? So, um, you know, it's a testament to the, to the people that's putting in the work. Um, and then ultimately, um, EXP also has a kind of a multi-level mar- marketing uh, piece to our side. So I'm partnered with over 320 uh, real estate agents across 32 states and and just 
you know, the goal is to put them in better positions. That's it. So, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's been good to us. Nice. <laughs> so we start Deep Blue Capital. I actually invested in your deals before we even ever started Deep yep. Blue Capital. So that was the first time that we really partnered on on anything um, that was not just a business, but, yep. but actual assets. When did you guys make the decision that getting into, you know, the build to rent space was still sort of multifamily because you're developing uh, duplexes and townhomes, you know, for rent. Yep. Uh, I invested in a deal with you in, in Florida. Uh, that was a, a class A multifamily. What was it that made you guys decide we're going to transition into multifamily and, and how, how did you get started yeah. pursuing the first? No, great deal? question. That was a decision. Again, there's not, there's no, we can't have two chiefs. Right. And that was a decision with my brother um, to, you know, we 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 slowly ventured into the syndication space. Right. Because that's a lot of responsibility, and a lot of pressure when you start taking other people's money and and everything we've done. If we've had a partner, it's just one other partner in our deals. Um, and so, you know, we, we it was always kind of more self-funded, which, you know, it's it's while there's pressure there, it's our own money. So if we mess up only impacts a, a little bit of uh, just us. And so, but we knew that with what our network was, there was, there was opportunity to help people invest their money, invest it hopefully wisely and in the right space and, and then get to experience some, some tax, you know, some, some tax saving strategies, right? Because I, I, I watched this, um, Instagram reel the other day of this financial expert showing like someone who makes two hundred fifty thousand dollars in California and all the taxes that or it was you no know, seven hundred fifty thousand in California, how much taxes they pay? It's fifty almost fifty two percent. Wow, in taxes, right? And um, you know from that, you know we were like let's let's just show people how to do that. Number one, and and then hopefully you know it's good. You know, there's a good. 2x, you know, 3x return on their money, three to five years, they can just keep it going and parlaying it so that they can, you know, either build their retirement or change their, their, their wealth trajectory and then just kind of open them up. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a, a partner um, and that Orlando deal. We're, we're not, we're just capital raiders. We're not even the GP on that one. So we were capital raisers on that one to, to kind of get acclimated and, and, you know, get, get our network going. And so that was our really our first taste in the syndication space. Now, quickly after that, we syndicated out a uh, two other projects. So we did three three deals back to back to back, um, and it was for the eighty nine uh, the eighty nine townhouse uh, uh, development, as well as a ninety six bed assisted living facility. Now everything sounds great, right? We're going through that. Actually, the the Orlando project was the third one right, on I think that. that was the third one. Because that was in 2021. Yep. So in 2020, right before COVID, we syndicated out an 89 townhouse development and a 96 bed assisted living. We closed on it. A week later, everything shut down. Oof. Yeah. Right. And and I will tell you that, you know, that has led up to some major changing events. And this is something that I want people to hear. And I'm 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 more than I'm an open book. So, you know, you guys know my backstory. So don't don't shy away from any type of questions, but that was the most stressful time in our lives, yeah. right? Because if you look at it, you know, number one is both two of those three projects. The Orlando one was not stressful because number one, we weren't the GPs on it, but it was already built. Right. The other two were not built. So you have COVID going on where you have to start developing the land. The cities shut down. So you can no longer, they weren't issuing permits. Yeah. They weren't sending people, even though it was outside, it's a whole different podcast that we can do. And so we got delayed by over eight months. Wow. Now, what happened during COVID? Labor shortage and material supply chain breakdown. Cost soared. Mm -hmm. So what we budgeted for costs tripled. Wow. And so that just threw everything out of whack. Our our timeframes were delayed, and and ultimately in 2021, my my brother um, passed away, and that threw everything else into chaos. Right. So we look at everything of of when you invest with an operator, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'll, I'll do this and we can bring it back. When you invest in an, with when you invest with certain people, 
I look at it in, in who has a fight or flight mentality. And, you know, when my, my brother passed away October 6th of 2021, October 7th, I went out to our job sites and I rallied the troops. I said, guys, we're going to finish this. You know, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot riding on the line and we got the, the assisted living took priority. Um, um, and, and we, you know, we're working because they were, they butted up to each other that luckily they were right next to the job site literally was right next to each yeah. other. And so the, the, the number one goal was to get the assisted living at least to a certificate of occupancy level. So we could start, you know, leasing out, um, the memory care homes and the, one of the residential care homes. So we could get that rolling and start money coming in. And then ultimately the, the next goal was to then, uh, align with the dupe or the, the townhouse development to start getting at least the first few, you know, CO so we can start renting those out so we can have money coming in. And as we look at this, as we look at all of this, that um, we look at, all right, we, we completed these projects. That is a huge win. Now the 89 townhouse were 50% complete because ultimately during that time, interest rates started going up, the cost started going up so that we did not want to put a project in jeopardy. Right. right. And this was, we had a lot of uncertainty going on and that's when interest rates shot through the roof. So your construction loans were now eight, nine, 10%, mm -hmm. some even higher than that. Yeah. And then your labor and material hadn't come down yet. Yeah. And so here we are today, mm -hmm. you know, the 96 beds done. So we, we've, we've turned that over. Um, and I own 10% of that still. Um, and then, um, the, again, the 89 townhouse, we're kind of in that limbo stage of, do we sell it? Do we hold it? What, what's the best move yeah. for what's happening in this economy? Right. And so those are decisions that operators have to make, and they're not always going to be the most popular ones with your investors. Yeah. I mean, that's gotta be, you know, Talk about a tumultuous two years, right? You, 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 the emotional roller coaster of number one, pulling off two deals in a close period of time, right? And then you have COVID and then you lose your brother and your business partner, right? Like kudos to you for even making it through and let alone as much as you've thrived yeah. since then. You yeah. Know? I mean, you talk about overcoming adversity and fight or flight. I mean, sure, that probably would have been a lot easier for you to say, you know what? throw your hands in the air and walk away and yeah. deal with a bunch of angry people, but sure. you, you stuck with it. And, and, you know, we've talked about what you're doing with, with those properties and man, that's just a testament to, to the will to succeed. You and, know? I, and I will tell you, like, again, the 89 townhouse is not out of the clear. Yeah. And so it. that is one, again, as operators, we are experiencing that and Brian's an investor in that one. Right. So like, so it's like when you look at all these and say, all right, who more are we investing with? And, and I always use the analogy. Of, of you don't care who's flying the plane. Once you, when you, but once you get up in that air, you're 36,000 feet and all of a sudden something happens, you start to pray or whatever you do. You're like, man, I hope this pilot and th this crew is experienced yeah. enough to get me down on the ground, right? And ultimately, that's what an operator's job is to do, right? Yeah. When shit goes bad, how do they respond, yeah. yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, you could have just gone to your investors, I'm sure, and said, hey, listen, building materials are three times yeah. as expensive. So we're only going to build a third of the units, right? I could have done that. I could go, I could have gone, and it's always on the table. And, and as even Deep Blue, it's it's there's always a, a break in case of emergency glass, yeah. which is, hey, sometimes we have to do capital calls. Yeah. That's not a favorite thing to do, but that is always on the table. But that's the last thing you want to use right before it starts to get into other other areas and i would much rather the way i look at it and the way i take consensus on on certain things i like instead of doing capital calls can i return investors money you know even if if, if it's a break even hey we got out of this unscathed i'm sorry like it didn't hit the performance but we also had covid we also had a death of a key principle that we still got to this yeah. let's uh yeah you know it's it's kind of like in blackjack right you hit a 21 and the dealer hits, you know, the dealer has an ace showing. They're like, hey, take that insurance. And you're like, yeah. Or you take the even money. Take even money all day, yeah. all day. Right? Take even money. Yep. Yeah, I think it's important that that our listeners understand that, right? I mean, I think syndication and multifamily has been glorified in the last few years. Not every deal is going to work. Yeah. Right? Not every, not every, not every stock that you buy yep. is going to work. Right? Yep. But the only thing that's consistent is taxes, 
and money market accounts. Yeah. Right. And if if that is if that is your risk profile, then fantastic. Go go have at it. Right. But if you're looking to make investments and 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 invest with people that are resilient and gritty enough to get through it, right? Must some of them work? Yeah. And some of them don't. Well, and and sorry to interrupt, Brian. No, no. Okay. Um, you know, I look at it and we had, I'm blanking out on his name, so I apologize. Matt, I think it was you and I just on the show that day. The investment group out of Houston. Um, I'm blanking out on his name. Dog on it. But we, Cody? Cody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and when we did our pre-show call, and, and, I, and I love Cody for this because he was willing to share the losses, mm-hmm. right? The, the, when we go to war, right, this is, this is a battle. We're battling to make it to win. But there's going to be times that we lose, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, you know, no one bats a thousand, you know, the, and, and, you know, we do want to make sure that, you know, we always minimize losses. And, and when you're investing, it is a risk. And I, I am here to say as an, as an investment group of ours, hopefully I can speak on, on the, y'all's two behalf, because I think we feel very similar to this is like, I want to share when things don't go as sure. planned. Yeah, because everyone always talks about the wins. They always talk about how great, you know, you know, and, and this is that um, um, the guy that ran the biggest Ponzi scheme out there. Oh, Madoff. Madoff, right? I watched that documentary, and always he was always hitting returns. Yeah, even when no one else was, I'm like, what is that guy doing? I was like, yeah, it was not real. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And you see some of these syndicators out there who now become glorified rock stars because yeah. the, all they talk about is these wins, these wins, these wins. And in reality, they're not sharing what the losses were. They're they're burying that. And yeah. I would much rather say, guys, here's our win loss record. Yep. Right. Here's what we do. And I will tell you, even during this time, I'm going to show you what we didn't just give up. We didn't roll over and say, yeah, I'm sorry, guys, we're we're ejecting from this because it's too hard. We're going to put everything we got, every muscle, you know, every every move is going to be in the best interest to 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 make this the best play for us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of this comes, I think we talked about this briefly early on. I think a lot of this comes from our leadership background, right? Like as leaders, we always owe it to our teams and now our investors to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, Agreed. right? And yeah. if you got bad news, talk about it early, talk about what we're going to do, talk about how we're going to learn from it and how we're going to do our best to avoid it in the future. I mean, right? a hundred. And this dovetails really nicely with the, the point that I was going to make about Nick before it's actually that's been one of the more disappointing realities that I think that we've come to know since being in the multifamily space is the amount of people out there that are like guru level syndicators that when you find out how their deals are going on the back end there's a lot of them that are a mess and the reason that I, I bring that point up is it's the same with residential sales for me and Nick when you build residential sales teams like we have you start to know a lot of other owners of sales teams. And then you kind of start to find out over time, like a lot of people that have a lot of production, they don't make a lot of money on the back end. Right. Like their businesses are actually a mess on the back end. You, you wouldn't know that from the amount of awards they get, you know, and all the times they walk across the stage, but they don't have very good P and L's and their, their business is kind of a mess. It's, it's, it's been similar in the multifamily space because I don't know that everybody has Nick mentioned that fight or flight mentality before they're, they're, I feel like I've come to learn there are a lot of syndicators out there that kind of reach this glorified level of success. But the reality is like, they're always just trying to get to the next deal so they can get that next act fee or that next asset management fee or whatever. Um, But when stuff starts to go wrong with their deals, they're not well prepared for it. And and there might not be the types of fighters that you actually really want to invest with. The analogy that Nick, Nick made about the pilot before, I think that's slightly off because the thing about, the pilot analogy is the pilot has to have that level of experience and training because he doesn't he doesn't get to to he doesn't get to learn on the way down if the plane breaks he can't figure out how to fly it in the moment right he's got to already know the reason and, and nick, nick, nick can attest to this the reason that i've always been like the perfect lp for nick who never blows him up about anything or you know i know everything about the deals and the challenges that we've uh, you know we, we've we've been introduced to and things like that because Nick is somebody I've always known that when the plane breaks, even if he doesn't know how to fly it in that moment, he's going to learn. He's going to figure it out. I think that we've done that really well at deep blue, but Nick having gone through what he did with his brother, like I saw him in a era area of his life where he could have just, like you said, thrown his hands in the air. Nick was not the most experienced person to be leading some of these deals. That was his brother. 
But what Nick did was decide, I've just got to get this plane on the ground now. And I don't know a person in my world who will go to bat for his people and go learn what needs to be done more quickly, efficiently, and with more effort and passion and heart than him. So that's the jockey that you want. Right. Because you really can't find a, a syndicator that's experienced at all. I mean, there's so many different variables for a deal. What you really want is a syndicator or a sponsor or, or a leader that they're just not going to throw their hands in the air because they don't know enough about what they're doing or haven't been through that particular moment before. They're going to buckle down. They're going to double down and they're going to go learn what needs to be done and they're going to take massive action. Well, when you think about an, a group, right? My brother and I, we're, we were the group. Yeah. And again, he was the chief. He That was his company. I was a partner, but he made the decisions. He ran the show. Yeah. And when, when, you know, when, you know, he passed away, I get, you know, now it's, it's the throne's passed to me, but I'm an inexperienced operator at that point. I can only go off of what I've been told. I can go off what I've seen. And then I have to go based on bringing in, you know, what we did at that time. And I've had some great people around me. Low Hornbuckle's one of them. Um, you know, him and I, like if you were oil and water, like how we how we do things, you can ask him. But he's he's our our partner and operator in Say Joke, the assisted living, right? Um, residential care homes and memory care. And um, one thing that I did learn from him is that you know when things go when things aren't going well, bring in other people to to come and do a kind of a, a compliance check or just a um, just to see how's everything running. And and don't, you know don't get upset about it because it's definitely. You know, it's definitely real or raw and it doesn't feel well when people are like, this is not going well. This is not going well. This is wrong. That's that's bad. And but then you go and can correct it. Yeah. Right. It, and it's it's quality control. Yeah. And, you know, what I found is is in the syndication world, you've got one main person as the the one that's out front and then the people behind the scenes. My what the major question I have, and that's the beautiful thing about this group, is that we're all involved, so somewhat equally. The only thing that I don't do at a high level, and I and and one of my mentors, actually Omar Khan, taught me this, is like I don't underwrite. I trust the underwriting of of Matt, and then you. Like if it's coming down to me, then we're not. I, I'm not the underwriter, and I won't be the underwriter. He said, "If that's not your strengths." Go to the people that have those strengths and then figure out where where the where the you know it's strength finders. And so that's something that I will do. I'm not going to become a person that I'm not. And and you know, the the biggest part about this is when I was thrusted into that that spotlight of of how to figure it out, I did a deep dive on everything and I would go to trusted my trusted network that did, that didn't have a vested interest in it. They didn't, you know, whether it failed or went positive, there was no gain or loss for them. Mm -hmm. And then I went to their, then I did every recommendation they had or talked to every person they put me in contact with. And one thing that I do when I speak on, on something, it's not, I don't just make it up out of thin air. I speak on, on, you know, on, on research. Yeah. And so that's the biggest part about it. And I will say where I am blessed to say that when that happened, that was the worst thing that happened in, in our family's life. I never had to worry about money because of the, the, and I'm going to jump ahead. I want to ask the question is like, why multifamily? And what is that? Multifamily, you know, the multifamily investment world and the investments that we have and the income that I started to earn off of it allowed me not to worry about money during the worst time in my life. Mm. I got to go to work, not worrying about money. I got to go clean up a mess, not worrying about money. I got to put things back in the right order, not worrying about money. And I want to make that a clear point of why should someone start investing in these types of deals? Well, when shit hits the fan, you want to have nest eggs because I could never imagine going through what we did as a family and also having financial problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny as, as you're saying that, uh, you know, they say money can't buy you happiness, but when you're not stressed about you know, paying your bills and keeping a roof over your head and yeah. providing for your family, it gives you so much more mental mm -hmm. bandwidth to go fight, you know, bigger things in life. And I think that's, that's a, that's one of the big thing takeaways I just said from what Nick said. So, uh, 
you know, we have a, a, just a few minutes left here. We're coming up on time. Nick, as you as you think about your history as a leader and in, in your real estate business and kind of going through the last couple of years, you just said like you're not the underwriter. I would agree with that. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> but you're really good at at at, at shooting at our underwriting, I'll yeah. tell you that. What what you know, where when you think about your role in Deep Blue and your role in multifamily, like what do you what do you think you're strongest at and why? Uh, I'm I'm great at being the negative skeptic. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> and and looking at because I've been through some worst case stuff mm. that I've got, and and I hate being that person. By the way, it's just how life has presented. I'm I'm very skeptical, and asking questions that's not always fun. Which is again, if it's a home, if we're saying it's a home run deal and one thing goes wrong and now it's a loss and it's an out, it's never a home run in the first place. Right. It should all be, it should go from all right, it doesn't go well, then it should be a single, double, or triple, um, and never a massive loss. And so one thing I feel is is being being kind of the black hat of this group, but the network I have with the reputation is is to me is is priceless. And and you know, to say that, you know, you know, I'm living off of my brother's coattails, but that's only gonna last for so long. Of of you know for the for my network and now it's starting to get into like Mark Allen, a commercial broker, good friend of ours. Um, you know I've gotten to know him really really well when he was really close with my brother. Other commercial brokers have that knew my brother Austin now coming up to me and starting to have these conversations and we we're definitely two different types of people, my brother and I, and and how we how we respond and how we um, articulate things. And but we're starting to develop this relationship to say, hey, you know, Deep Blue Capital is not going anywhere, and we're here to grow something very, very massive for for opportunities for you know real estate professionals and software technology people and people that that make great income, but they don't have the time to go learn the investment side because that is the hardest thing to do. Think about it, you're working a full time job. You're tired when you come home. And if you have children, yeah. if you have a partner or spouse, now you've got to go learn. You're going to go take classes. You're going to go learn and then ultimately try to implement the, the lead generation strategies to go find an apartment or to buy a rental property and then try to do that over and over and over again. That's exhausting. Yeah. That's why most people don't do it or they, they talk about doing it. They'll go consume and read books and like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But they have no time. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, what I believe is, is number one, I feel that my strength is I can connect with, with people and really show them that, Hey, your money is in good hands with us here. Yeah. And that if you're going to entrust us with this, then it's our money to the, to, to go to fight for, and we're going to come and return it for you. Yep. And we don't take that lightly. 100%. Yeah. I mean, there's so much there, right? I, I agree with you that you know, I think you're a fantastic devil's advocate, right? And I think there's been, <laughs> it's true. You got to have, yeah, right? yeah. have one. Absolutely, you got to have one. We can't have everyone can't be a yes person. No. Definitely, definitely. Um, but I, 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 I will say that I've seen firsthand, and and you know, right after we started to, right after we met each other a few years ago, you know, you've always been the guy that kind of rolls up his sleeve dives into his network. You know somebody that knows somebody that's seen this before, and you know, typically on some of the hairy stuff that we've seen with each other inside of a day, you have someone in your network that's given you an opinion yeah. or a perspective yeah. on it. And look, I'm not the best responder or communicator, but I will go true. when shit hits the fan, I'm going to work. Yeah. So. What I, one thing I realized in this episode, Nick, is that you're really good at self-awareness. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, it, it comes down to that and understanding like we all have strengths and weaknesses. Mine yeah. is I'm not the best communicator, but again, when I need to show up, when especially when it's a crisis, it's going to be there and we're going to get it done. Yeah, hundred percent. If you need Nick there, make sure you send the calendar in right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. You'll accept, and then he'll show up not knowing what he agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> I do. I like this last question before you oh, before you jump off. What is the last book that you read? Um, I just pulled it up because I always forget the name of yeah. it, and it's um, it's called Dirt Rich. Okay. And it's about um, it's about owning land, right? Like. I don't know something as I'm getting older, getting into hunting kind of. Yeah. I think I am. Really? Yeah. Um, and and I'm starting to get into some stuff about owning land with water rights and everything else. That's all in another show. Um, it's kind of the prepping side. Yeah. Um, but there you're not making more land. 
Yeah. And so it, and it's another investment strategy where I'm starting to see that i never saw land as truly as the valuable gold asset that, that others have. And I've seen a lot of people make great money off of it and there's ways to make it to where it starts to build residual income if done correctly and you set it up correctly. Okay. So, Love you know, that. I'm kind of going down that path. Nice. Love that, Love that man. Always into something new. That's it. Any yeah. closing thoughts from you? Mr. Force, I've just really enjoyed this. I mean, I talk to Nick every single day, but we talk about a million different things. So sometimes it's really nice because I'll, I'll just we're, we're always like really open and honest on this podcast and then our friendship and our business partnership. Like I, I, I like revisiting these things sometimes because it gets us to stand back from the mirror and just look at how things have developed and progressed and get to know each other as people again, right? Like Nick just mentioned before, he's not the greatest communicator. I think that he said that on purpose because I chewed his ass <laughs> out the other day for not responding to me for something that I thought was pretty important. And, um, but he's very self-aware, right? And I try to, I try to remember in the times where our personalities can be like oil and water because I'm, I get really anxiety ridden when I don't respond to people. Like I can't, not do that right nick's always doing a million different things and he is a man of action i have a thousand twenty three unread text messages yeah Oof, which by that the would way drive me crazy clean that up dude. Oh i don't understand come on there's 900 of those are not get important. off those there's get no off the, all those shopping lists <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say, right? yeah. like, all how, the shopping how much of those are access codes to like some software you were logging I, into yeah, or yeah. something i wish, right? I wish that was the that. case yes. right but being able to step back from the mirror and, and remember like where we've been and how we've got here. We don't think about that enough. Yeah. And so it's been really nice to just kind of, well, and I will say like, journey. again, as I get older, you know, we, we grind a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. And we still, I still have it, but as we get older, I'm starting to learn to unplug more. I got divorced because of this, the, the real estate business, like, yeah. because I work 24 seven, um, you know, and I have three kids now, like after Austin died, there was like, my my communication's gotten worse in terms of quickly of responding after that because I, like it's like all right i've got to get especially the last 2 years i got to get more plugged in to being present with family yeah because it it is a i mean it's time wins yeah we all lose to time yeah and so i want to make sure that we're spending like i don't want to look back and be like man you know my my soon to be 2 year old is now 7 yeah. i'm never going to get back the funny moments that she did because i don't remember because i wasn't there or it was i was so focused on on something that really wasn't that important and so you know that's something that that even i told brian when he chewed me i was like hey thank you i love you for doing that and this is what i'm this is what i'm going through when i don't respond you know, it's not that I don't care. Yeah. Right. It's that, hey, when things there's things going on in people's lives and um, you know, it, it was we had a client who almost passed away. And and um, you know, you you know, sometimes we respond very coldly in this business, like, why are they not doing this? And like, yeah. oh, you find out, oh, your mom almost died. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah, you should go handle that. <laughs> and then it makes us put things back in, in perspective. We all need that in our lives. Yeah. 100%. I listened to, I think, uh, an interview on the Tim Ferriss show a few years ago. You talked about, you know, being there for your daughter. And I, th I think it was Shonda Rhimes, if I remember correctly, okay. maybe somebody else. And she said, kids spell love T I M E. Yes. Right. And, and I hear you, man. I used to travel a lot when I worked at HPE and I was gone. My kids were like young, two, yep. three, four. And all of a sudden I realized I was gone three or four days a week yep. for two years. Yeah, like, I gotta stop. Right, yep. I'm I'm never gonna get a second chance yep. at this. And I went and, to three basketball games with Asher on over the weekend, and like, you know, it was just again, he's like, "Dad, off your phone." I'm like, "Okay," like, yeah. like if they're saying that, then something's up. Yeah, sure. I think yeah. you took a a bear crossing webinar prep call from the pool in florida i did yeah i, I and did I think, I think heather posted it on her facebook stories with you on our phone call i, did. At the edge well, of the pool I was in i was in orlando working, when and i said i felt so bad well because well no but i'm also i'm also always prepared yeah you know prepared at least for the important stuff <laughs> let's put it that way you send me a counter invite i'm not always prepared for that one but the next day we had our bear crossing capital raise webinar yeah and i don't again i don't like to look foolish yep. right so i always want to come prepared and we were preparing and that's something look that took that was 30 to an hour and then the next night it was two hours and it was successful and it also made that was a cool thing the next day we went to disney yeah. like all right that's the best part pretty of the good trade-off yeah <laughs> so so we there's 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 checks and balances right so when it's something that's super important again we're going to show up yep. and things that 
you know, we all value things differently. And so I'm like, all right, this is not as important to me when it comes to family, but raising capital and not looking foolish to a commercial broker, that's definitely important. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> if so. Nick, if you wanted to leave our audience with one thing on leadership or real estate or life philosophy, what would it be? I mean, there's two things, right? At least from a leadership and sales, money changes hands when problems are solved, right? So if you're you're looking to solve problems, you're looking to make more money, just figure out what the problems are. And, and as if you can solve it, you're gonna you're gonna always make money. And um, what was my other thing? I don't know. That's always been my motto is, is money changes hands when problems are solved. And, and you know, something you hit earlier, money doesn't solve problems, doesn't make you happier. But when, when something does happen, it may not fix it all the way, but it makes things a lot easier when you have money or you don't have to worry about money. So I do believe that having some self-awareness around building your financial reserves and your financial war chest should be top priority yeah. for every person, whether they have a family or not. Yeah, that's huge. Nice. Man. I love that. What do they say? Any any problem that you have that can be solved with money is not a problem. It's an expense. Yes. Yep. Right? Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. This was fun, boys. This was great. Yeah. I'm excited to keep I can't wait these. to be in the hot seat. I yeah. know. I'm a little Nick nervous set the bar now. pretty high. You did set the bar pretty high. I'm usually the one that has no problem talking for a long can time. Can we get a couch in here so when, I, when it's my turn, I can, it can be like a therapy session? Yeah. <laughs> Just lay cool. it out. Yeah, lay out. What uh, kind of couch do you want? It? Leather. Please. Yeah. Black? Yeah. Totally. Oh, yeah, I think we all know the counts we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks for listening, Nick. Thank thanks you. Thanks for going in the Absolutely. hot seat today, man. This is awesome. Team, when when listeners, when we talk about get to know your sponsor and, and get to know your sponsorship team, this is exactly what we're talking about. Nick was vulnerable, completely transparent, retrospective, the whole thing. Now you're inside Nick's mind. If you're worried about his thousand text messages, don't worry because our deep blue capital text thread is pinned to the top yes, so he, he never forgets us it is for sure <laughs> uh but yeah this was awesome what do you think b love it boys I'm, I'm excited to keep doing these thank you for listening make sure you check out t-o-r-e studios tour studios.com and deep blue com, the home of deep blue capital we got some lois out boys yeah, right now i'm feeling two, pretty two good going out today we got a couple more Let's going go. out today so make sure that you are on our newsletter and go create your investor profile over at deep blue re so you can see the next uh, deals we got coming down the pipeline love it thank I, you boys i think this is going to be the last one that comes out before uh before santa comes so yeah. for those listeners out there celebrating christmas merry christmas for those enjoying hanukkah enjoy happy kwanzaa happy boxing day yes happy what's the what's the Everything. one from seinfeld uh, uh uh oh my gosh uh festivus yes happy festivus <laughs> for the rest yes. of us happy holidays <laughs>